Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrea, I'm Product Specialist here at ProdPad and with me today is Sharon Lowe from Microsoft. Uh, we're going to be talking about product ethics today, which is a wonderful topic. Uh, before we get started, just so that you guys know, we will be uh, answering questions at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can drop them on the Q&A section or the chats. I will be looking at both. Um, and we'll be reading back your questions to Sharon at the end. Um, of course, uh, as with all of our sessions, this will be recorded. So if you have to drop off, don't worry, you can always catch it on our YouTube channel later. Uh, and if you really, really like it, uh, you can send it to a friend. Um, cool, with that said, uh, Sharon, go ahead. Great, hey everyone. Um, it's really good to be here today. Um, Okay, um, I'm Sharon, as Andrea said. Um, thanks for tuning in on a Thursday afternoon. Um, I'm a product manager at Microsoft um, on our ethics and society for AI team. So primarily working on a lot of our AI products and platforms. Um, and yes, I'll talk about what my team actually does. And I'm just re really excited to talk to you all today about building ethical products. and. I think we're all realizing that in this changing world, especially today, so much has happened in 2020, um, that technology is also moving just as fast. And it's almost outpacing our ability to adapt to it. And we're left with this kind of anxiety around what are technology's implications and impact on our future. And so today, I really want all of us to lean into that anxiety because I think it's gonna be the impetus that drives us from being more reactive to proactive about our futures. And as a reminder that no one's figured out ethics and technology yet. This is open waters for us to define um, what ethics can and should be. And so with that, I wanna first start with the prompt. I want you all to think about um, what are places that are meaningful or memorable to you? And while those places are coming to mind, I want you also to think about what are maybe some commonalities or patterns of why those places resonate with you and if there are maybe any exceptions. So to ground this, I'll talk about some places that came to mind for me when I was asked this question. So this is kind of a smattering of random places. Um, but at the top left was actually a local restaurant that my family used to go to growing up every weekend. So it was kind of this like second home to me. And the top right um, was my very first apartment in Seattle. Uh, bottom left um, was a coffee shop that I went to all the time in college after class and just to decompress. And the bottom right is actually where I had my first kiss. <laughs> And the reason why I asked you to think about those commonalities and patterns of why these places resonate is that as, as an, uh, being on an ethics team that works in AI, this is what AI systems do all the time. AI is used to answer a question or complete a task, and it does this by deducing patterns based off of past data. So when you ask an AI model the question, what are places that are meaningful to me? It's trying to figure out patterns of whether these places are meaningful because of how often you're there, maybe how much time you've spent there, is it who you're with, is it why you were there in the first place. And I think this simultaneously also illustrates the shortcomings of AI, because one, as humans, we aren't rational, we don't always fit into perfect patterns. And so AI models miss the happenstance or the places that we become meaningful just because of something random, like you're at a subway station and you hear a song come on, um, that just really resonates with you. And number two, as I mentioned, AI works fundamentally off of past data. So it's using the past to predict the future. And so often that means you're not accounting for growth. So AI represents who you were, but maybe not who you want to be. And a lot of us have grown from the people we were five years, three years, even a year ago. So that definition of meaningful and what matters to you also changes with time. And I bring this up as a really small example of that we often use technology and AI to represent or replace something. And as you can see, it's not able to represent something in its entirety. And so now imagine that short cell everywhere all the time. 
And how sad does it become when we start moving to a future where what's meaningful to you is actually defined by technology and it's a compromised version versus you defining what meaningful means in the first place. And I think this kind of loss of agency, this confusion of whether technology is controlling us or we're controlling it really came to light in 2016. We saw how AI systems and massive amounts of data with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica really influenced democratic processes, institutions, and elections. And this was a big wake up call for the world and the tech industry that we're no longer just designing products anymore, that we're designing really complex systems that are impacting fabrics of society and culture and norms. And so in 2016, Microsoft had to really critically ask ourselves that this was a challenge and how did we want to really approach building products in the future. And so we came up with six ethical principles of how we saw this future of building technology. Um, the fact that we wanted a future of fairness, of inclusion and transparency. And these are the principles that we wanted to use to guide us in how we built. And principles are great. Um, but also principles are vapor if they're not really reality. And so the question was, how do we not just make this window dressing? How do we actually bring these principles into product development? And so my team at This Anxiety was created. And so we're a team of 30 people, of designers, PMs, engineers, and ethicists. And basically we act as an agency within Microsoft where product teams come to our team and we work in sprints and defining and helping think through product challenges and vision and, and what's the best ethical path forward and how do we actually bring these principles into product development and reality. So today, I really wanna to talk to you about my time on this team and what I've learned since then. And so two main topics I want to focus on is one, why is ethics important to your business? Um, in my time on this team, I've learned that ethics does affect your bottom line and why it's something that's not just a nice to have, but a must have. And number two is, okay, ethics is kind of a really abstract topic. So how can you tactically be armed with tools and actual steps to start bringing this into, the, into your own work? So number one is why is ethics important to your business? And I think the fundamental answer is something that I think is not too surprising, um, which is customer trust. And this is something that I actually learned a lot when I was product PM, so back on our feature team. So before I was a PM on the ethics team, I worked on Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud offering. And back when I joined, which was a couple years back, um, Azure had not, was, had, did not have as much adoption. And so really in the last few years, it's grown exponentially to now 90% of the Fortune 500 uses Azure and Microsoft Cloud. And so when I was on Microsoft Azure, I worked on this product called Azure Data Factory. Um, and this is Azure Data Factory. It wasn't the sexiest product, <laughs> but it was a really important stepping stone in Azure because the first step of being in the cloud is that customers need to move their data from on-premises to the cloud. And my product, Azure Data Factory, was that product. It allowed customers to kind of move their data to the cloud. And you know, think a couple years back, five years back, um, a lot of startups were excited about moving their data to the cloud. But when you think of big enterprises, which a lot of Microsoft's customers make up, um, oil, banking, healthcare, no one wanted to move their data to the cloud. It was too much of a risk for their information that was extremely sensitive, patient information, banking information, to be in the cloud. And so there was a fundamental lack of trust. And my job as a PM, actually for the first few years, was to fly on site to a lot of these customers and have conversations for them to build that trust and move their data to the cloud and kind of form this partnership with us. And I started realizing that trust is often think of a really singular entity, but it actually comes in layers. And at the basis, there's a foundation of casual product trust, which is that your product says what you say it will do. Um, but there's also this higher order, almost emotional trust, where a customer trusts you as a partner, where they really believe you are invested in their shared success. 
And when I was in a lot of these conversations with customers on site, there were also a lot of other competitors in the room. And we were all convincing customers to build this partnership with us. And I would say Microsoft had a really extremely high emotional trust card and that it was really powerful in the end. And that when it came to even maybe not having the cheapest features or even having as many features, this trust card ended up trumping the business deal and winning the customer over. Um, but at Microsoft, we also acknowledge that trust is changing all the time. And it's something that we all know is earned very slowly and lost very quickly. And we often say in the company that trust powers our business because, you know, just like we've asked, we were asking our customers back then and taking a risk and coming to the cloud, as we're asking our customers to take larger and larger risks and innovative leaps with us, trust is that really important factor for customers to come along with you in this journey. And we're realizing that this next wave of the way trust is going to be built is a lot through responsible innovation. I've seen in the time that I've been on the ethics team in a lot of customer deals, especially around AI products and technology, where customers really want to work with partners that they think are being really intentional about this innovation because they'd rather do it right than do it fast. And so I've, I know we've talked, and so now we've talked about, you know, hopefully why this is important, uh, but I want to spend the really the bulk of the um, talk and understanding how we do this in practice. And a disclaimer is that I know from my perspective coming over as a product PM, I come from a computer science background. So I had a question of, hey, I don't, I don't have a moral philosophy background. I don't know Socrates. And so how can I think about what's ethical and what's not? Is that really my place? Is that really my expertise? And I want to frame this problem differently because I think it's a lot more approachable than maybe it sounds. And so there's this graph by Kenneth Bowles that I think illustrates this really well. And so there's two axes on the X, it's time and Y is actors. And this pink square is where he's saying a lot of times product development takes place. That we're thinking about our users and we're often thinking about what's the impact on them now. So we all have our backlog of 100 features that our customers requested 10 months ago that we're working towards. And so we're always really concerned about develop, delivering product impact immediately. And a lot of times as PMs, I think we also extend along the x-axis. So we think about what's product impact over the next couple of months, over the, over the next year. I think it's a little bit rarer that we go a couple years, probably very rare that we even think about beyond that. And I think it's really, really rare for us to think about users beyond our direct users or who's impacted beyond our direct users. And so when I say ethical product development, I think it's actually more about how do we extend the square? How do we extend our field of vision to account for everything? And so instead of ethical product development, I want to name it and brand it as intentionality. How can you be really intentional as a PM of who or what may be affected and how they may be affected? And as PMs, you are the best person to do this because you are the subject matter experts of your product. No one will understand or think about your product as much as you do. And so there's responsibility in your perspective. Um, what you see and what you don't see, um, or what you don't see, anyone else is very unlikely to see. So it's really important for you to uncover any blind spots you may have about your product and really be intentional about what you focus on and what you choose not to focus on. And so let me break down this question of intentionality because there's two parts to it. There's who and what may be affected and how, right? So let's first focus on who or what may be affected. And how do we think about this problem? So we often, you know, when product teams come to us as an agency model, this is kind of the first step that we do. And we break down actors into three main groups. We think about them in terms of direct, indirect, and excluded. So direct users are the users as PMs that we often develop for. They are direct customers, they are the business stakeholders, they are the developers and the builders. But the other two groups are ones that maybe we don't often consider. So one is indirect users. So these are users that don't use your product but are still affected by it. And these could also even be non-human factors such as the environment, 
such as maybe historic buildings, for you to really consider outside the scope of just people. And lastly, there are the excluded users. These are users who can't use your product either due to physical or societal constraints. So when you think about, for example, the firewall in China, users of Facebook are excluded in China um, from the product. And so I learn a lot by example. So I wanna kind of contextualize this into an actual product team that approached us the end of last year. And this was a product at Microsoft that we shipped um, at August, in August 2019. And it was this product called the Custom Neural Voice. And this product was basically the capability to synthetically generate voice fonts, basically meaning based on a couple hours of my voice recording, they would be able to generate a Sharon voice font and use that voice font to theoretically say anything. Um, so yes, implications are scary. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's focus first on the actors in the system. So for custom neural voice, in terms of the direct users, these are customers who want to generate a voice font. Usually these were companies who wanted to create a branded voice um, for their company. Um, these also include the voice actors, so the actual talent who would be recording their voice, or, and also as end users and individuals interacting with the voice font. Now, when we think of indirect users, this is where it gets really interesting because we might not consider voice talent agencies. And as our time on the team, we also worked with estate owners. These are people who wanted to use the voice fonts to generate voice fonts from those who had passed away. Um, this even impacts lawyers, right? Because right now voice recordings, audio recordings can be used in a court of law. So if you can synthetically generate voice, how does that fundamentally change the legal system or kind of a legal argument? And lastly, for excluded users, these are hard of hearing or deaf individuals who may not ever be able to interact with the product, or even those with speech disorders, because you know, what is their likelihood to generate a voice font? And so again, it just kind of takes you into a wider lens for you to think about how this product impacts the entire systems and the users within it. The second part of the question is how they may be affected. What's the impact on our actors, right? And I wanna pause on the word impact because I think the word product impact has always been touted as a really positive thing. But to fundamentally remember that impact is actually a neutral word. It could also mean negative impact. And I know that's a tricky space as PMs to be in because we love building products. So it's also sometimes hard to acknowledge that our products can actually inflict harm and negative impact. Um, but I want to reframe again the question instead of saying what are all the bad things that can happen if my product ships to actually reframe the question as what are new problems that my product creates and this quote by Paul Virilio illustrates this really well, which is when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. When you invent the plane, you also invent the plane crash. And it's basically saying that I believe in technology we've taken a really solutionistic view of our solutions, that technology can solve all these problems. We've also seen that as we ship products out in the world, it creates new problems. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but as PMs, we have to be able to make the trade-off and weigh do the benefits and values outweigh the new problems that your product may create. And so as we were working with product teams, we quickly realized this question of what are new problems that your product creates is a really abstract question and really hard to frame around. And so we came up with a framework called the HARMS framework. And this was basically a way for us to get a 360 view of the possible unintended harms that your product may create. And we liken this to kind of in privacy and security, there's threat modeling. And so this is kind of the responsible innovation complement to that of how do we kind of see the risks up and around the corner before they happen. And so the way we defined harms is actually through first four higher level categories. And they are the following, risk of injury, denial of consequential services, infringement on human rights, and erosion of democratic and societal structures. And it goes from risk on the individual, which is risk on injury, to the broader society, which is the erosion of democratic and societal structures. 
And within each of these higher level categories of harms, there are subcategories of harm. So with, for example, within risk of injury, there's both physical or emotional harm. And I'll send over the links after, there's actually an even double click on those harms. And the thing is what we do with the product teams is we do an assessment across the board of what do we think the harms look like and what's the severity um, that we believe this product could inflict on maybe, again, that time scale in a year, in five years, and even a decade. And so I want to, again, ground this in the example. So I'm going to, again, use custom neural voice, which was the synthetic voice product that we talked about a little bit earlier, and see what the harms framework looked like for a product like that. So if we think about risk of injury, emotional harm was one that was high for this product. If you think about, we thought about, for example, if your voice font was stolen, for you to say something that you never actually said, that is fundamentally traumatizing and feeling like your identity is compromised. On the other hand, as end users who listen to synthetic voice fonts, it could also be psychologically harmful for you to be duped into believing something's real when it's not. Um, so what were mitigations that took place, right? So this fundamentally changed a lot of our legal policies when we rolled this product out. So we, for, in order for customers to generate a voice font, we needed written consent from the voice actor. So no voice font was being generated from someone who wasn't aware of what was happening. And when it came to making sure end users were never duped into believing something's real and it's not, we did a lot of work around design and the user experiences that should accompany synthetic voices so that there was always proper disclosure and that users were always in on it and they would never kind of believe something when it wasn't true. The second part was denial of consequential services. And so economic loss was high in this category because we realized that we were really affecting an entire industry of voice talent and voice actors, right? So for example, a voice actor may have been paid 100 hours for an audiobook, and now they're only paid an hour for their voice font, and that voice font could theoretically be used forever. So how does that impact their career? So again, this played again into a lot of our legal contracts with customers that they needed written consent from the voice talent. We also went a step further in creating transparency notes specifically for voice talent audiences. So when a voice actor was signing, they had to read this transparency note to understand what exactly they were consenting to, what were risks and capabilities of this technology, and also notes for them to be aware to re renegotiate their contracts so that they were properly paid for given this new system. The third part is infringement on human rights. Loss of liberty was high here because we really thought about the idea that your voice is often real now, today, really tied to identity. Um, but if something can be synthetically generated, your voice may no longer be tied to you. And so how do we think about this scale and loss of identity? And so this was actually one of the toughest harms to address because we actually chose to gate this product meaning not everyone can have access to custom neural voice. You actually have to apply and go through a pretty stringent interview process with both the product team and our team for us to evaluate what's your use case and do we really believe you're using this product for benefit and good for our society. Um, and this again was a fundamental business decision um, to make sure that we were really optimizing for the good of this technology and minimizing the bad. And lastly, there's erosion of democratic societal structures. Manipulation was really high, and this really tied to misinformation. So when you think of synthetic voices, probably something that comes to mind, it's deep fakes, fake news. And in light of the 2016 election, we were really, really worried about this particular harm. And we really went back to the end user. We thought about, from the end user perspective, when would they expect to listen to a synthetic voice? And we felt like when it came to, for example, politicians and government officials, that it is not in the expectation of users for any of this to be synthetically generated. So we actually made a specific position that we would not allow the use of this technology for any politicians or government officials, even with their consent, um, that this was something that we would not support with this technology. And 
I think it's easy to say like, whoa, so we really kind of went far into the future and why are we being so intentional and so careful? And it's because of actually stories like this. So the voice talent, for example, for Siri, Susan Bennett, she had no idea that she would be the voice talent for Siri until it actually happened. Her friend actually called her and was like, I think this is your voice. And she goes through of how this was actually a pretty tra traumatizing experience and really alarming to have your voice kind of be out in the wild and everywhere. And so we're being really careful because imagine what happened to Susan Bennett, Susan Bennett um, on a 10x scale, right? We always talk about impact from 1x to 10x, but the same thing can happen to harm. What happens if this experience happened to a lot of people? And this is why it's so important for us to be really intentional about this technology as we deploy it. All right. Um, the last kind of lesson I want to touch on is we've talked about, okay, our actors, we've talked about how they may be affected. And now the question is, well, then how do we solve for how they may be affected? How can ethics be used as innovation? And I want to start with a small and simple example, because I think a lot of this sounds really complex, but there's, it doesn't have to be. And so this is a product that probably a lot of us have used and come across, which is a big pen. And when Big first launched its pen, it actually came across an unexpected harm, which is that a lot of people were choking on the pen caps. And they were kind of wondering how this was happening. And it's because people were doing this. They were putting pen caps in their mouth. Um, children were also kind of playing around with it. And with a sudden gasp, the pen cap would kind of, you know, launch into their throat and they could easily choke. And so Big could have done maybe the easy way out, which is, you know, make sure that legally they were compliant. So maybe on the box, kind of have that disclaimer of, you know, do, is not a toy, do not swallow. We've all seen that before. But Big actually took it a step further. And if you look at all Big pen caps, there's air holes. And those air holes are there so that if someone were to swallow and have kind of a worst case scenario, they would actually have the best case experience because oxygen would still be going through and they wouldn't choke. And so this is something I want us to keep in mind because I think this is the kind of intentional user experiences that we want to design. How do we think about what are the potentially the worst case scenarios and make sure that, again, we are optimizing for the good and mitigating the harm in those scenarios. So let me also illustrate this with technology and some, how we approached it um, with something on our team. And this also came, unfortunately, from a harm that had actually been a, around for a while. So in August of last year, we actually had a PR incident around Skype, which is that this article leaked where Skype audio, so audio from your conversations were listened to and quote, by workers in China with no security measures. And fundamentally, this kind of confusion of users feeling like, hey, like why, why does Microsoft have my data? Why is it being listened to? I don't know how this happened. It's because of experiences like this. Um, I think we've seen this all the time where we kind of get a consent screen for data collection. We don't fully know what it means. There's a link to a long privacy statement that we don't read and we just quickly click allow. And so this is really a problem of data ethics that when we say really broad terms like product improvement or improve the product and donate your data, People don't know what that means. They don't know it means that sometimes we're using that data to transcribe and improve our speech models. And that means strangers have to listen to you talk. Um, people weren't aware of like how their data was being used. When strangers are listening, what does that really mean? And they weren't understanding how Microsoft was actually protecting their privacy and security. And when we think about these privacy policies also, they're fundamentally designed actually to protect companies from liability, but not at all to inform users of what they are consenting to, right? So the New York Times did a study on 150 privacy policies, and on average, they take 20 minutes to read, which basically means they aren't read at all. On top of that, they're incomprehensible. The average kind of education level to read a privacy policy is at a college level. And we all know this, and we do it and we keep doing it in the industry. And so our team really had to ask a quick look of, hey, you know, how do we actually think about this differently? How do we think about consent differently? 
that this is actually a value exchange. We're asking users to trust us with their data. And so what do, what do they deserve in return? And so we really thought about what it meant for someone to give meaningful consent. And meaningful consent was defined by us in four pillars. That one, that users had awareness when they were making a consent. They understood what data they were consenting to, who had access to it, how long they had access to it for, is it shared? They had freedom of choice and they had true control that they could opt out and revoke their consent at any time and manage their data. We also thought a lot about what the user journey could and should look like. That today, when you grant consent to something, when you offer a company to allow access to your data, it kind of looks like this. You kind of get prompted. You don't really understand why it's happening, but you click allow because you want to keep using the product. And then you don't really understand what happens to that data after. But we were like, what if this journey looks something like this? where you actually have time to use the data, discover the feature. So when, by the time the consent happens, you understand what it's asking for. And you, you also actually get a receipt. This was actually a really new concept that we were thinking about, is that this is fundamentally a transaction. So how do you get confirmation after you give us consent? And then how do you manage your data afterwards? And so unfortunately, I can't share the whole end-to-end -end user experience because this is something that we're actually still rolling out. But I want to show maybe one of our screens and it shows how we've really thought about how do we change this consent actual request into something that's really, really not clear into something about what we actually mean. And instead of saying, saying, allow Microsoft, we're really asking, will you help? This is an invitation for you to help us as a company, for you to donate your voice clips or your voice conversations so that we can improve the speech model for your language, for your accent. And we're also really clear about how we protect your privacy. The fact that we actually make sure that no conversation or no recording is longer than three seconds. The fact that we actually distort your voice and so that no one can actually identify you as the original speaker. This is a lot more clear and for you to finally make the decision if this is something that you want to consent to. And so to bring it all back, you know, when it comes to building ethical products, I don't want it to seem daunting. It's really about just starting conversations and starting questions. And along the three questions we talked about, it's, you know, who or what may be affected? Who are the actors? How may they be affected? And then think about how ethics can be used as innovation. But going back to that big pen example, it doesn't have to be complicated. And so it's really just about being really mindful about your blind spots. And, you know, I really want to end this, end this presentation where we've talked a lot about ethical product development. But actually, again, the foundation for all of this to work is actually the people and the people on your team, the culture of your company. And this was something our team thought about a lot, that in the end, for ethics to be important in technology and to be our future, it's not enough if only our 30 person team thought about this. It really has to be the culture of the company and for everyone to be working towards this. And so when we thought about if we really want to put the, our money where our mouth is, we have to think about how ethics can be how employers actually value their employees. And this happens through things like your salary, your performance reviews, and your rewards. And so I'm really excited to say that our team worked with Microsoft for our organization for the first time this year where ethics was actually part of everyone's performance reviews and everyone had to make a commitment, an ethical commitment of what, where they wanted to move the needle. And at the end of the year, they had to evaluate how much they had moved the needle. And this, this played into how people were properly rewarded. Um, so again, I really am really thankful for being here today and talking to you about ethics. And all these resources are available online. Andrea will send a link to a lot of these things like the HARMS framework for you and your team to kind of dig deep into. And with that, I wanna say thank you. Amazing, thank you, Sharon. Um, as uh, Sharon said, we will be sending all these resources out um, as a follow-up, but let's answer some questions now. Uh, the first one we have coming through is, how can companies balance business outcomes, uh, like generating revenue, showing growth, with better ethical decision making, um, especially if it is far off uh, risk or impact? And is there anything individuals can do to manage upwards and help direct ethical decision making? 
Yeah. Let's break that. Let, let's, we might want to break that down. So <laughs> how can uh, companies balance uh, business outcomes um, with better ethical decisions? Let's start with that one. It's a great question. I, I really think it's about looking long-term versus short-term. Right. And a lot of times of how I like to think about this is, you know, really learning from history. So a question I like to ask myself is imagine that I was a PM on Facebook newsfeed 10 years ago when it was first developing. How would I have thought about ethical and product decisions to be really mindful of the power and influence it could have five or 10 years down the line? And so I, re I th really think it's about prioritizing and thinking about those second order effects and bring them a little bit closer and also being really aware that it's really hard to retroactively do ethics. It's kind of like putting the toothpaste back in the tube, right? By the time it came to 2016, it was really hard for newsfeed and Facebook for it to go back to trying to revert if it's wanted to instill ethics into the product and maybe making optimizing for the benefit. And so that's something that I would really keep in mind that you are, you are taking on debt if you are moving ethics into a conversation later in the future. Um, and in terms of you know, thinking about leadership and how do you get stakeholder buy-in, um, that is something our team has learned a lot about. It is really about convincing leaders in your company. And a lot of times it's really helpful because you know, a lot of PM is about being customer focused to actually talk to customers of like, hey, if you're thinking about deploying this technology, what are you concerned about? Um, what are you concerned about you, that what users will think of you? What do you think would be the worst case scenarios? And how do you make sure you get customers saying, we're worried about this, and then bring to your leaders, we need to focus on this because our customers are concerned. And if we don't focus on this, then we are short selling them. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is your perspective on the role of technology companies versus the government? And not only considering ethics, but making decisions about who gains access to a technology and who does not. It's a great question. It's something that our team has really wrestled with because we feel like a lot of tech companies and capitalistic institutions are being put into processes where we're not elected democratically by the population. Um, I would say realistically though, technology is moving so fast that a lot of times legal regulation is not catching up with it, especially in the space of AI. So in my team, we work a lot with computer vision. Um, we, we think about things like surveillance technology and regulation has not caught up with where it needs to be. And so a lot of times, you know, when we work with product teams, they are like, hey, we needed to ship yesterday. What's, what's the legal and privacy min bar so that we can get our product out the door? I think we hear that a lot. Um, and ethics is really about raising what that means right now, because unfortunately, government regulation has not caught up. So a lot of times, and, you know, Brad Smith, who's our chief legal president, is often urging regulation, um, legal and the government to add more regulation in these fields um, so that we are not forced to define it. And we need a lot more legal and technical expertise in government so that this can happen. Um, but I would say realistically, and unfortunately right now we're in this space where we're kind of up to defining it. And why I think it's so important for more and more people to be part of this space. I am often really concerned that as an ethics team, understanding that we are solely based in Seattle, which is a very Western view and small part of the world. And so how can we be defining this with, from all cultures, all countries, because ethics needs to take into account um, the world internationally. And so having more people part of this conversation is really important. Uh, thank you for your question, Audrey. Um, the next question is, do you think it's enough to rely on companies to be ethical or do we need more external frameworks or assessments um, into holding companies accountable? You know, it's something that at Microsoft are really trying to hopefully just kind of set the table stakes so that I think we're seeing, you know, lately with facial recognition um, that IBM was actually the first company to say, hey, we will no longer work on facial recognition technology at the company. 
Um, Amazon followed up shortly after with we will not support facial recognition um, by law enforcement and Microsoft followed after that. And so I think my challenge back is a lot of times, you know, as companies, when you set something on the table as table stakes, your competitors are forced to answer to that. And so how can you kind of be the first in the playing field to do that? And again, it's a tough spot to be. Ideally, <laughs> going back to this the previous question, that this is actually something more quickly regulated by government. But I think right now it's up to us as companies and for us to be proactive in defining what is the future of this technology that should be. Because again, we are the experts of making these products and understanding it right now. And so we have the best understanding of how this will play out into the future and the second order effects of it. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and if anyone is interested, uh, last year, C. Todd Lombardo and I had a webinar um, around product ethics as well. And a lot of it was around second order consequences, which um, tends to not be something people stop to consider and think about. <laughs> <laughs> but but definitely very very important um, we have a few more questions uh, guys please keep on adding your questions in the Q&A section um, so the next question is um, it's amazing that you have thoroughly considered ethical impact of the voice font technology but how do you safeguard it against people who want to misuse it uh, they now know that this technology exists so what's stopping them from copying it and using it maliciously yeah I, I think it's also understanding that, you know, bad actors will always be able to, you know, misuse a tool, right? Um, a hammer could be used to, you know, hammer a nail, but it could also use to be, to kill someone. And it's something that for us to really think about what are the checks and balances we can put in place. Again, I don't think we can ever prevent the bad from happening fully, um, but we can put enough checks and balances and road bumps in place to make that something very difficult. But I think it's first acknowledging, well, what is the bad that can happen and how do we put mitigations in place? For voice font technology, we've thought a lot about, you know, how do we verify when you're creating a voice recording and we have, first we think about the written consent, right? But when you're submitting the voice for a voice recording, how do we ensure it's actually the voice of the voice actor that you're not just, you know, putting in someone else's voice so we have checks and balances there. We do a lot of checks after and creation of the voice font to again, just ensure that we are making sure we are getting consent from the person who's doing it. Um, but I don't think our expectation is that we can ever fully prevent any bad from happening because the bad actors will always exist, unfortunately, but it's really about optimizing for the good and mitigating for the bad. I hope that answered your question. Um, <laughs> Next question is really interesting. Uh, should ethics sit as a separate team that assesses all companies uh, or, or all the products in the companies? Uh, or do you think it's best to um, allow it to be part of the process um, mm -hmm. for all product teams? Yeah, I, I think definitely the goal is that it will be part of the process. And I think about ethics as probably where privacy and security were 10 10 years ago, right? Uh, you, privacy and security used to be an after, afterthought for a lot of software development. And now it's so baked into what we do um, when we ship products. I don't think ethics is there yet. I think we're just kind of at the cusp of forming, you know, what does ethics in the product development process mean? What does ethics and engineering practices mean? But I think the goal is that in the next couple of years, ethics becomes part of every product team, just like privacy and security. Great. Uh, next question is, um, what are your thoughts on how to apply ethical standards when building models, especially when those models are predicting the likelihood that a person belongs to a certain demographic rather than predicting a behavior? That's a great question. Um, and it's something that we've been really thinking about um, when it comes to Microsoft about what models we are creating um, and are we perpetuating further biases. Um, so we often, when we think about demographics for our AI models, often it's just making sure 
that when we ship something, that it works equally well for everyone. So for example, when it came to the speech model, it's not enough to just, you know, verify that the speech model when it comes to speech recognition, it works for just a thousand random people. We were really diligent about collecting people who spoke different languages, but also within those languages, people who spoke different accents, um, but also maybe kind of that, you know, like immigrants, like my parents came from Taiwan and they speak English, but they kind of have a Chinese accent behind it. And so how do we think about all these different scenarios and make sure that the model works equally well for everyone? Um, we really try to stray away from using models to predict demographics. Um, and again, it's something at the, t at the company that we're on a slow process of redefining. I can't say that for all of Microsoft. We've done that successfully yet. I think the goal is that we are doing a slow culture buy-in of being really intentional about what AI models should be used to predict and not predict. Um, and that in the end, AI is probabilistic, not deterministic. I like what you said there. Um, thank you for that. Uh, our last question, I think, um, but of course, if you guys, uh, you know, have more, uh, drop them in. Uh, but for now, our last question is, um, and I love this one. Do you think tech products can ever truly not be biased when humans are making them? I don't think so. And I, I think the goal is not for technology not to be biased, because as you said, there's bias kind of in everything. So I think it's really hard for something to be not biased. Um, but I think it's actually more for us to how do we frame the way that technology and AI is used. And this is something that we're really working with a lot of customers and how do we demonstrate that through our user experiences, because I think a lot of people use AI and expect it to be a magical black box that when I use it, I'm gonna get these really insightful answers and it's gonna be the correct answer. But how do we really, how, how do we treat people more as AI as a tool and not the answer? And it's a tool that guides you as a person to make the best answer. Um, and so we really think about what if AI models were a little bit different? What if AI experiences so for example, if when Netflix gives you your recommendations, what if you can look into why these were the recommendations it gave you? Is it looking at the themes of the movies? Is it looking at the actors in them? Is it looking at the length of time? And for you as a user to be like, hey, like I, I like this ingredient in my AI model, or I don't, like, I don't agree with this. And so I really think it's also this education problem that we need to do with the public of how do we inform people the proper use of AI and technology. Um, and we're really thinking about, again, back to user experiences and exposing AI to users of maybe not saying, you know, there is 78% likelihood of X, and so not making it deterministic, but again, probabilistic. Hey, it seems like from X data, it may be 78%. We recommend you look deeper into Y. And so, you know, really, again, going back to AI as a complement, as a tool, it's not the answer. I, I'm not sure if I answered the question. I, kind of I, I, I think you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes complete sense. I, I, I don't think there's such a thing as non-bias, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly with a group of people. Um, mm -hmm. But what helps is to have as much diversity as you can within that group of people. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, you know, you, you, you are in one part of the world and you need to consider um, other parts of the world and, and their own cultural backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's difficult to do, um, which right. is and, diversity helps. And I think that's also we've been thinking a lot about also how do we design feedback systems within AI more? Because, you know, when you're shipping something out, the problem is, you know, when something doesn't work if something doesn't work for a certain population or a certain person, which is bound to happen. How do you allow that person agency in giving feedback to the system of like, hey, this doesn't work for my use case or this doesn't work for me. And right now, I think AI systems are not designed to do that. And again, going back to that Netflix example, I'm not able to really say like, hey, these aren't recommendations aren't working because I didn't like this movie. You can kind of exit out, but you're not really sure if that kind of played back into the system, right? And so how do we design that transparency around that feedback loop so that the models really get better over time? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. I think that that is all the questions for today. I'm not seeing any more coming through. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up now. Thank you, uh, Sharon, so much for joining us today. This was fantastic. Um, to everyone that is here, thank you uh, as well for attending. And as I said, we will be sending out um, the recording over the next few days uh, and uh, the links um, uh, that Sharon has. And if you want to join us for our next webinar, we will have uh, Adam Thomas talking about uh, how to hire the right team. So that'll be a good one. Uh, thanks again, Sharon, for being here with us today. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew, for having me. And thank you all for tuning in. Bye, everyone. Have a good one.